thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm here in Hartford with Mark Basile, and we're at an Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth Symposium. And why I asked Mark, and I wanted to invite Mark to speak to the, um, to the viewers, is because in the case of the World Trade Center dust, when they found nanothermite, Mark, you've had some experience or at least looking at it, and I would start with, if I give you three questions, one is, why are you here? Um, what got you interested, and what have you learned? And if you would, help those people understand, because maybe they don't understand. Maybe they haven't taken the time to do any research. And where if they listen to someone who did, you know, we may be able to help others, preferably in the future, like right. my children. So why am I here? You mean yeah. today? Yep. Uh, I'm here to learn. Um, basically, uh, there's a lot of questions that I still have, even though I've spent so... Oh, Gosh, it's coming up on four years, three and a half, four years of um, research time looking at uh, World Trade Center dust. I still have a lot of questions, so uh, I'm here to learn, and um, it's an important thing in life. It's a good thing. Um, and the next thing, what have you learned? What have I learned? Well, I've basically looked at um, four different samples of World Trade Center dust right now, two of them quite extensively, too, I've just received in the last couple of months. Um, what I have learned is that in the dust, there are what uh, those of us who've uh, been doing this work call red-gray chips, and these pictures behind me here uh, basically show some of those red-gray chips. Um, they are, the term that I'd use to describe them that really gets important to their most important characteristic is thermitic. And basically what that means is they have the properties of a material called thermite. That's all it really means. And what thermite basically can do is make liquid iron, traditional thermite. And uh, I've looked at a number of different chips from two different samples that I've actually found uh, thermitic activity within the red material of the chips that are in those dust samples. And uh, the stuff really shouldn't be there. So um, that in a nutshell is what I found. There's material in the dust that can make liquid iron. And once again, if we, if we, were, if we were firemen and we showed up at a fire and we found accelerants, that would cause us concern. We'd say, gee, I wonder what the source was or how this fire progressed or something. And in the case of these structural collapses, Okay, of the Twin Towers and also Building 7, to find this material in the dust, it would make one consider, or at least anyone who would give it consideration, would say, gee, why do I have something that makes steel into liquid? And how did it get there? Why is, why it, is there? it there? And who did it benefit for it to be there? Yep, it, it really shouldn't be there. I mean, I would never build a building um, where I would put this material into the building. Um, it, its only reason for being there is, uh, I think it was associated with the buildings coming down that day. What the mechanism was, how exactly it was used, you know, I can only speculate, but again, um, it's there and uh, more people should be looking at it. Um, I don't know if there's more I can... Um, well, the other one... Well, actually, I was going to say, in, 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 in the dust, um, you, you sampled four different things. Um, was the consistency, like, like, was it the same in each of the dust, like, like the amount of... Um, no, it hasn't been perfectly consistent. The biggest chips that I've seen came from the very first sample that I received, which came from a woman by the name of Jeanette McKinley. Her sample was also referenced in the peer review paper done by Jones and Harrod and all. And um, she supplied me an independent sample. She sent it to me on my request, and um, I started looking at it. The chips, the biggest chip that I found in her material was almost... Uh, about two millimeters square, something of that size. Um, most of the ones, like for instance, in the most recent sample that I just received from a former New York PD um, gentleman, uh, are very, very small. They're probably, oh, I'm estimating, I haven't actually put in any of a scope to measure them yet, but probably the largest ones are going to be maybe two, two tenths of a millimeter uh, across on a side. And, um, and actually, the red material in there seems to have been fairly well disassociated uh, from the gray layer. Mm -hmm. um, they're much smaller. Um, I'm not sure why, but uh, the material looks like the same thermitic material, but I haven't actually tested it for that property yet. I'm still in the segregation phase, going through the sample and trying to segregate all the different materials of interest. But, uh, but it looks to me to be the same. 
Um, there are a number of materials in there that can be confused. Uh, I've heard a number of people talk about, for instance, the, the primer that's on the steel in the building. Okay. And I've actually seen it myself. I happened to take a trip down to Washington, D.C. Uh, there's a museum down there called the Museum. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No. Well, anyway, they happened to, one day when I was there, they had an exhibit um, which basically was the radio tower from the top of one of the World oh, Trade Centers. Okay, yep. And they actually had it there. And you, you could get pretty close. I couldn't touch it. Um, but I could get close enough to see the actual paint. And then underneath, a lot of the primer underneath was actually exposed. And it has an orange color. Mm -hmm. So yep. as I go through here, I do find orange chips, which I think are steel primer. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also finding these red. And a lot of times, it's the red-gray material together. Um, so th there's a lot of different stuff in there. Have you there's found any? Of, have you found any of those um, quote iron spheres? Oh, the say? microspheres. Yeah, they're everywhere. Okay. Yeah, they're and so there. once again, to atomize first off to liquefy steel, let alone to be able to atomize it. For my viewers and stuff, if they've used like a perfume spray bottle or any spray bottle, um, there's uh, there's a, pro a I want to say there's a, I don't know if I'm going to call it process, but there's what's called surface tension. Right. Anytime you have a liquid. Okay, and it's free floating and or falling, whatever you get the teardrop shape, but you also get surface tension, which will make it spherical, correct? Correct. So at some point, you know, this this steel and then this dust finding microspheres of you know iron and steel, that had to be liquid and then it had to be separated from everything else to what? For the surface tension to make it into a sphere. Because when you buy uh, iron girders or whatever, iron, it's not made up of a bunch of spheres. Right. Atomically steel doesn't go in, hey, I'm sphering today. Don't mind me while I sphere with my other steel buddies. Yeah, All right. yeah basically what I, I could go into a lot of things on that actually. Go ahead. A, um, one of the separation methods that we use in looking at the dust is magnetic separation. It was what Steve Jones originally did, was he brought a magnet near the dust and he was really trying to, I think, segregate out these iron microspheres. And I've used that technique and it works real well. Mm -hmm. You can pretty much, what I like to do is I actually do it under a stereo zoom microscope and I basically put a petri dish with a small sample that I'm going to work on and I pass the magnet underneath it. And so I can basically take like all the iron microspheres, move them over to one section. If I have any red gray chips, I can bring them over to another section and basically deposit them there, then take them out and put them into vials so that I can work on them later. And I pretty much go through the whole sample that way uh, in the beginning. The, when I first started getting these iron microspheres brought to the, um, to the magnet, one of the other things that I noticed coming to it besides the red-gray chips and a lot of various rusted materials and so on um, were what I'll call um, glass spheres. Okay, and or teardrops in a lot of cases. There was a lot of, I think, um, fiber, glass insulation, asbestos insulation, mineral wool insulation in the building. And it evidently, in the same way that the steel experienced these extremely high temperatures, that, yeah. to melt it and then, like you Make say, a state. A, a, yeah. right, a free falling liquid will form into a sphere because of surface tension. And it really comes from you're minimizing energy that surface energy is minimized in a sphere because for Thank a given you. volume, the sphere has the minimum surface area, and so it's minimizing energy. That's why it goes into a spherical shape. Thank you. Um,